So hi folks, my name is Matthew Ostwolz and today I'm going to, I'm going to uh, discuss the topic of uh, the importance of letting kids be kids globally. Before I begin though, I'm going to ask you a quick question. So what comes to mind when you see the word child soldier? So if you just want to yell it out, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Africa? Oxymoron? Boys? Anything else? What's that boy holding? Guns, okay. Drugs, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to come back to this in a little bit and discuss how um, my personal journey uh, has brought me to understanding what it means or, or the, a better definition of what it means to be a child soldier. So I never thought I would uh, go from being a, uh, being a tank gunner in Afghanistan um, to going to a classroom filled with uh, 20, 20 little kids, uh, short, <laughs> uh, and telling them, you know, keep your fingers out of there, or do you got to go use the bathroom? No, are you sure? And then ultimately, me cleaning up after them. However, that's the experience that I've had. Um, and when you look at, throughout this talk, I'm going to talk about four specific events in my life that brought me to where I am today. And within each of these, they may not look like they're interconnected. They look like four very different um, experiences. However, in my life, they came together to, uh, to bring me to where I am today. Um, so here's a picture of me in Afghanistan. A uh, tough Canadian soldier, pre-dad bod. <laughs> and so in high school, I didn't know what I wanted to become. I, I enjoyed uh, politics. I enjoyed uh, history. Uh, I enjoyed humanitarian issues. Um, and I didn't know where I was going to go when I finally got to adulthood. And so I defaulted to join the Canadian Forces. Uh, here's a picture of uh, Afghanistan, and through my experiences in Afghanistan, I had a lot of negative, negative memories of Afghanistan. However, um, and like many of my comrades or friends, they've had only negative things to say about Afghanistan when they came back. Uh, but for me, I was able to pull certain things, certain positive aspects of that experience that, um, that I was able to ingrain in my memory. And one of them is this, this picture right here. So if you look, if you look at the image, um, this here was a gate guard area. And you see to the right of it is a fence, and you see a school on the opposite side of it. Um, so there's a better picture of the kids. And I remember I would be, I would be there with my C8, and I'd be walking along this road, and I'd be looking at the kids, and I'd be thinking to myself, wow, like, with war all around them, with everything that's going on here, you know, there was gun battles in the distance, there was, uh, it was just a negative environment for kids, bombs on the road, or IEDs throughout the road, and these kids were happy, they were excited, they were laughing, they were playing, they were running around, like kids are. They were basically kids being kids, right? And they would often be there kicking around a soccer ball. And I'd watch them kicking around the soccer ball. And the soccer ball had been repaired countless times, like probably like 15 times. Duct tape, duct tape, duct tape. And so it looked like a medicine ball. When they'd kick it, it would like roll really slowly. And so it, it's those memories, those kids, childhood innocence that I think of um, that brings back a positive, uh, a positive memory of my time in Afghanistan. Okay, so fast forward five years, I got out of the army, and when I got out of the army, um, I remember my first, my first week at university. My first week at university, I was probably the oldest kid in the classroom. 
uh, most mature, probably not the most mature, but I was the oldest in the classroom. And I remember being in there and thinking, oh man, I'm missing something. I was missing the military, my experience, uh, the camaraderie that comes with being in a certain place where you're protecting each other, and the pride. And so I remember thinking to myself, how am I ever going to fill this void? So I got my education degree, and I, uh, with my education degree, I started subbing. But I lived in Nova Scotia, so there wasn't very many jobs for teachers in Nova Scotia. So I'd drive around to different schools all over, and I would substitute teach. And while substudent teaching, I never really talked much about the military or my experiences. The only time that I would get to talk about it is when people are interested, which is right around Remembrance Day, and then they invite you to the school to talk. And so I became a teacher, and as a substitute teacher, you don't make that much money. And you're subbing all over. And so I applied for a job in Peace River. I got a phone call from an individual, um, from a principal of a school in Peace River, and she thought this was this, I was the perfect match for this job in Peace River. And so who was I to argue with her? I really, I was unemployed, not unemployed, but almost, substituting. And I had, a, I had a master's degree in adult education and a minor, or my education degree in, um, in secondary education. But I wasn't going to argue her, with her because she was giving me a job. And so that's how I became a kindergarten teacher here in Peace River. <laughs> so there's my last class that I had. Um, yeah, they're cute. And so I... Teachers, one of the responsibilities of being a teacher is supervision. And teachers, absolutely, we love supervision. I mean, 20 supervisions, can I get a couple more? No, 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 you'll have to ask another colleague. No, teachers don't like supervision. But I remember being out supervising in the freezing cold, and, you know, I got my radio on, so if anything happens, and I'd be watching the kids playing and they'd be running around and laughing and playing and imaginary play, and it was the innocence of childhood again. And it just hit me. They're, they were so... It was like watching the kids in Afghanistan playing. They were so similar, and they were kids being kids, which really struck out to me. And so... While I was in Afghanistan, however, there was other kids who weren't, uh, weren't as lucky as these kids, or the kids in the uh, image I showed you at the, at the beginning. So there was kids who were taken advantage of. There was kids who were being taken advantage of by armed groups, by rebel groups, by uh, state armies, by state police, and they were being utilized in war for different, uh, in different ways. So we have here depictions of a spy, suicide bomber, a cook, a frontline soldier, a porter, and a sexual servant. And so it doesn't matter if you're a parent or you're a teacher or you're somebody who works with kids. Um, if you're an aunt or an uncle uh, and you have nieces and nephews, The ways in which these kids are taken advantage of are things that nightmares are made of. We would never let our kids be treated in this manner, and yet there are kids around the world that are treated like this. So at the beginning of the talk, I asked you what came to mind when you said a child soldier. First of all, the United Nations estimates that there are 300,000 child soldiers active right now globally. 300,000 soldiers. Most of you, or some of you, let's actually let's get a, 
our hands raised if we say we thought of a boy as a child soldier? Okay. How many of you said a girl or picture a girl? Yeah. Very few. The reality is, is that 40% of child soldiers are actually girls. We also automatically assume that it's going to be the boy who's going to be the frontline soldier, and the girl is going to take the role as a cook, the stereotypical roles. However, in reality, there are boys who are cooks, and there are girls who are com commanders, frontline soldiers. The other thing is, it's not only boys, or girls, sorry, who are sexual servants. In Afghanistan, one of the things they had were chai boys. And so it was the boys who were taken advantage for sexual purpose. We also automatically assume that child soldiers come from Africa. And that's not the reality. Although there are countries in Africa, the DRC, Somalia, um, South Sudan, that do have child soldiers, that do recruit child soldiers, there are also places like Colombia in South America. We have Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Syria within the Middle East, and we also have the Philippines, which is not on that map. So it's not a, uh, it's something that is much bigger than we automatically assume. We automatically assume that it's some small territory, but it's global. It's a global phenomenon. So the first experience I talked to you about was uh, me being in the military. Um, the second experience in my journey um, was becoming a school teacher. The third one, I stumbled upon it, actually. And you may wonder, did, did I learn all this information about child soldiers from my experiences in Afghanistan? And I didn't learn anything about child soldiers in Afghanistan. Uh, as soldiers, we don't learn about child soldiers. Not at all. Um, we don't learn how to interact with kids either. And so all this knowledge um, that I have on the topic is actually from a program or an institute, the Romeo Dallaire Child Soldier Initiative, based out of Halifax. So I was on the internet one day, and I stumbled upon a program that's called the VTEX. So veteran trainers to eradicate the use of child soldiers. I stumbled upon it, and I went to apply, and the date had already passed. So I looked up the director's name, and I sent her an email, and lucky enough, I received an email back immediately. Uh, when I received the email, I read it over a couple times, and she had told me that a veteran had backed out, and so there was one spot left. And if I was able to commit a full month in Halifax, Nova Scotia, to do the training, then I would be accepted. And so I jumped on it. The training there was phenomenal. Working alongside Romeo Dallaire, we learned about child soldiers, children at war, recruiters, recruitment tactics that recruiters use. Uh, we learned about um, arguments you can make against recruiters. Uh, counter-arguments, and stuff like that. We also, the, the program was for veterans to teach um, military, to teach the police force, and to teach correction workers. I told you at the beginning about how um, that bond that I had being in the army, and that camaraderie that comes with being in the, the military, and how I had lost that. Um, this program, Basically, overnight, I found that. The void was filled. The pride in something that's bigger than myself, working with other comrades or other soldiers who had served in multiple missions, whether they were the same as mine or different. And so, this time, however, I was a teacher. I wasn't a soldier. And I remember thinking to myself, hey, is there something in here? There's, there's got to be... a there's got to be a way, as a teacher, with the relationship teachers have with students and kids, 
that there's a preventative measure to recruiting children. And so I kind of threw that around in my head a lot, and I returned back to uh, Alberta and went back into the classroom. I was lucky enough when I got back to be uh, chosen by the Alberta Teachers Association to go to Uganda to perform professional development training to teachers. So it's basically the same as in Canada. Teachers, they receive professional development training, and then they return to the classrooms with all these new techniques they've learned. And so the same thing occurred in Uganda. We were in Wakiso District, and teachers from all over that district came down to Mazalita, which is like a small little village. And they received professional development in uh, language and mathematics. And so while I was there, it clicked. It made sense. Teach teachers how to prevent the use of child soldiers, or in preventative methods to prevent the use of child soldiers, and have them teach the students and ultimately the community. So it was so simplistic, yet it would make such a big change. And so when I returned home, I started a nonprofit organization called Teach Peace Development. Don't get me wrong, it's not, a, it's not a big organization. It's just in its infancy right now. However, our goal is to uh, train teachers in Uganda in the prevention of and recruitment of child soldiers. The images you saw before, they are part of the kit. So these images we had made, uh, it's going to be part of a book. So the book will be included inside the um, box that a teacher gets. That includes a book, um, training exercises, training manuals, um, activities for the kids, and stuff like that. So it's something tangible that they get to bring back to their home community. And so I remember when I was in the Army, or when I joined the Army, and how excited I was to change the world. Or well, not change the world, but uh, be a part of changing something. And here I am today, realizing that change doesn't have to happen in such a global aspect. It doesn't have to be so big. If you can change something that ultimately affects one child, wouldn't you do it? And so at the beginning of the talk, I told you how I would discuss a little bit about uh, four events in my life that brought me to where I am and to where I plan on going. And so that kids, whether they're here in Peace River, Alberta, can be kids in Uganda, can be kids in Africa. Thank you. <laughs>